Hans Anthony would always say, there, there's no such thing as an advanced technique, just an advanced practitioner. Hey there, what's going on, party people? Welcome, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's episode 764, and my guest today is Professor Jesse Dwyer. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. We're here to connect, educate, and entertain all of you with our various projects, our products, and if you go to whistlekick.com, you're going to find all of it. It's all there. Every single bit of it is there. You can buy it there, or it's linked from there, so go check out whistlekick.com. If you're not doing that periodically, uh, you're missing out. If you want to go deeper on this or any other episode, there are show notes in your podcast app, but the full extent of those notes are only available at Whistlekick martialartsradio.com. There are some things that just don't work in podcast notes. So check that out. If you like this episode, go check that out. And while you're over there, you could sign up for our newsletter, which we send out once in a while, sometimes weekly, sometimes less. It's full of good stuff that's going on in our industry and in our company. And hey, we bring you two episodes each and every week. Hopefully you enjoy them, you appreciate them. And if you want to show that appreciation, you could buy something from us, maybe leave a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on, Apple, Spotify, doesn't really matter. You might also consider supporting our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. Starts at $2, goes up from there at $5 a month. Go check out what we offer you for $5 a month. It's kind of insane. Tons of value, and that's why people don't stop contributing to the Patreon. We get you and we keep you because we throw so much value your way. And speaking of value, if you find a lot of value in the things that we do, if you consider yourself part of the Whistlekick family, please check out the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. You're going to have to type it in. We put that little bit of a hurdle up for you to make sure only the people who truly love what we do will put in the time because apparently two seconds is too long for some people. And what are you going to find over there? It's the entire list of all the things you can do to help us out but we also put some stuff in there that you're not going to find anywhere else. Some behind the scenes, some bonus, some stuff from me personally. And it's, it's, a, it's a free sort of a Patreon. So go check that out. Today's episode is a wonderful conversation with a man that I respect very much. I know him much better now after speaking with him. But going into this, I had tremendous respect. Not because I knew him well, but because people that I do know very well have tremendous respect for him. In this episode, we talk about everything from how, when, and why he got started. We talk about circles that were completed, some, some you know, throwbacks, and we talk about progress within the martial arts, within his school, within what he teaches, and why it's not always something that people find appropriate. So hang on, enjoy this episode, and I'll see you in the outro. All right. Hey, Jesse, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. We've been, when, when did I start bugging you to do this? Three years? Five years? Yeah. It's been a few years, right? It's been a few. It's been a few. Yeah. That's okay. But, you know, it's, and, it's, and I apologize for the time, kids and no. life, you know? Life, life happens. I don't think you have anything you need to apologize for. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited and happy to be on it today. So it's my second Zoom meeting of the day. Oh, well, hopefully this one's more fun. Whatever, uh, whatever the first one I'll was. I'll be careful I'm, on that one. No, the I'm other gonna... one was a really great business meeting. Okay. I, I belong to a really awesome business group and they helped yep. me. They've helped me through COVID. They helped me get my oh, business awesome. back on its feet before COVID too. So it was good. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll probably not talk about those things. We'll talk about you. We're going to talk about you, Perfect. which is, is interesting because it's um, it's not always a subject people are comfortable with. <laughs> and if, because if they were right, like I, I wouldn't I would just say, hey, uh, send talk for an hour and then send it over and we'll make an episode out of it. But, you know, because <laughs> of that, I have a I have a role to play here. And I I like kicking it off in a really easy, boring and even expected way. How'd you get started? What was, you know, your martial arts origin story? You know, honestly, it's it's always my father and I always did karate. Mm. You know, we always worked out. He'd always show me a few moves. He had done martial arts as a kid. He was in the military. 
Um, never really got deep into it, but just boxing, some grabs, just different. We'd have kung fu theater all the time. Yeah. Every Sunday sure. after WWF, we'd be watching kung fu theater together. Um, and he traveled a ton. So once mm-hmm. I was getting a little older, he's like, well, I, you know, you still love martial arts. I'm like, I love it. And that's when a karate school opened up right down the street from my grandmother's house where I spent a lot of time because my parents were always traveling. And that was mm-hmm. my my instructor that I still have today, Professor Duncan. Oh, cool. uh, he, so yeah, we've been how, together how now almost you? 35. I was 12. Okay. Yeah. So I was 12. Um, yeah. And that was just, that was it. I walked in that door with my <laughs> Ben and Jerry's tie dye t-shirt, some sweatpants. And you know, uh, I'm going to give you a ton of love for that being, you know, yeah. the factory's <laughs> over there. That's right. <laughs> I walked in with that and I could tell he looked at me like, uh oh. And then here we are now with my kids calling him grandpa almost 35 yeah. years later. Yeah. <laughs> Age 12 isn't a common thing, right? I mean, you see that, probably see that now. Some schools have a strong adolescent teen demographic. Most schools don't seem to. And, you know, we're, we're almost the same age. So I remember it was not generally cool to be in martial arts back then. Was that, were, were you a rarity at this school? That age, uh, yes, I, I think I was. A couple of my friends in the neighborhood started it. I think they got the yellow belt or orange belt. Um, but I had just, I was that kid that ran around with a ninja outfit in the gullies. You know, I was on, uh, I was black belt magazine ordering the back of the magazine, my ninja costumes and stuff. Yes. So I think my first rubber throwing stars. Did you have any of those? Oh, tons of them. <laughs> tons of them. You know, the blowguns, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, totally. <laughs> totally. so I just always was into it. But at age 12, there was that, that gap. And I went right into the adult class then. Mm. So it was, there wasn't the younger ones were too young and I was definitely in the middle. Mm. So, so if you, if you started at 12 and you'd been doing this for a while, 12 is old enough to have an expectation of things. Mm-hmm. Was it what you expected? Yes, okay. it, it it really was. Professor Duncan had a way of j- just teaching that made you laugh. And, and then his knowledge wasn't, it was so multifaceted because he started when he was eight. And so it was all the same thing and all the different styles that he did. You know, if you were watching Kung Fu, he could do Kung Fu. So we were doing karate, we were doing the cool takedowns, you know, and of course I was in the adult class. So I had to be older and I liked right. always, you know, I always liked being with the older group. I worked better with the older group, but it really was. It was, let's just say at age 14, I named my karate school. And the only person that knew the name of my karate school was Professor Duncan at age 14. So two and years in and you know, this is your thing. This is what you're going to do. That's it. I told my parents, this is what I was going to do. And they laughed at me and I said, no, seriously, I'm going to be a karate instructor. And they're like, that's fine, but you're going to college first. So when your <laughs> business fails, you've got a degree to fall back on. They were realists. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, and that was it. I went to college at Niagara University and started my first, you know, official school, the, the Nukes, the Niagara University Karate Club at age 18. And I had 50 students by age 18. Wow. And that ran for four years. I graduated three black belts, and that program continued about six to eight years after I had graduated. Oh, that's super cool. It was awesome. I'm still in contact with a lot of them. My first male and female black belts were from that from that dojo. Oh, that's great. So you graduated 22 and moved back? Yeah, graduated when I was 20, yeah, 21, 22. Um, got home, was going to open up a karate school. But then I was like, you know, I want to do massage therapy also. That was kind of a thing back in the late 90s, right, you know, where, early where, 90s. Where did that come in? How does that come into play? It, okay. Somebody had said to me once, I was doing... I was in college doing something. I was a social worker. That was what my degree was in. So I was always looking for different methods to help people, not just physically, but mentally. And Mm -hmm. I got into a lot of, obviously, the Eastern arts and everything like that. And I, someone said to me once that, you know, anyone can kill somebody, you know, but they can't always heal somebody. But anybody that can heal somebody can definitely hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was like, wow, that's a really different way of looking at it, right? And I wanted to be able to heal somebody. And I wanted to be able to help them. And I had my you know, bones manipulated and massages at the end of some hard training. I was like, oh, man, I didn't think I was going to be able to walk after that. And so I got into that and I got into an amazing school. So I was going to do massage. You know, of course, at 21, you're like, I'll beat him up there. I'll beat him up and they got to come back to get healed later. Right. 
<laughs> tried to open up a school in Syracuse with a person in a mall when I was 21. Mm-hmm. And um, we were 50-50 partners, except he was the boss. Mm. So that didn't work. Yeah, that never um, works well, does it? No. And then I got done with massage school. So now I probably was thinking I was 22. And I saw online, you know, of course, you're looking at the internet. And there was looking for instructors mm-hmm. up here in New England. And okay. just out of the, you know, it was massive self-defense centers at the time. Yep. We were affiliated with them. And I just called them out of the blue. And they're like, yeah, we are. Well, are you looking to teach? I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for something. And I just drove up here and we drove around. I ended up taking over a location of some people that were leaving. I was 22, mm. 23. I was 23 by then. So I moved here when I was 23. I, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have family, friends, anything out here. I just yeah. wanted to teach karate. Well, I moved out here and did it. It was awesome. What did your parents think of that move? They loved me move, doing stuff. Okay. I, I think out of all of my friends, I thought I was going to be the one that was going to stay in Syracuse. Mm. All of them, everyone was going to move away and I was going to stay there. I had traveled a lot when I was younger and I really enjoyed Syracuse. And then I moved here and I realized how, how much nicer it is here. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's sun here. There's no sun in Syracuse. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and they were they were really good for it. I don't think they thought I was going to stay here either, though. Mm. And a year and a half after being here, I met my future wife. So it was kind of putting down roots. It was it yeah. that in stone, right? My father had was raised here, which kind of brings you back to that karate story. He passed when I was young, like 25, 26. Mm. I'd say I think I was twenty six. And as I was going through his personal belongings, um, we I found something as we're going through his little knickknacks. He let me backtrack a little bit. Sure. In 99 and 2000 is when we, I was first introduced to Grandmaster George Basari. Mm-hmm. We had brought him out to Syracuse. I had started training with him. Uh, he's the, you know, obviously the first person to ever bring our style of Kempo to the East Coast. And I started training with him a lot. And so that just to set the stone for there. When my father passed, I had found a business card. And in that in his little trinket, his business card was Senior Grandmaster George Vasari, third degree black belt. My parents, my father was originally from this area. Oh, so wow. the stuff that he had taught me, one of his favorite moves was actually the beginning of one kata. You know, the quick kick and then the jet, the cross punch. And we always worked that move, my father and I. And so the, the relationship, when I went to Grandmaster Vasari and said, here's my card. This was sitting in my dad's bureau. And Hefe and I, Grandmaster Vasari and I had like a really profound moment. It was great, but like it, it was good, you know. So now I realized that my roots were been in Kempo since yeah, the beginning. You, you were Kempo before you knew what Kempo was. I was Kempo before I think my father even realized he was Kempo. <laughs> wow. That's yeah, such a so, that's so cool. Okay. It was definitely so that's that. I moved okay. here and opened up a master self-defense centers at the time. Mm-hmm. And that lasted a few years. And um, we had differences. I had really great training underneath them. We just had some differences of how I wanted to move forwards and how Mm -hmm. we could do it. And we parted ways. So, and did you jump? Became Dragon Phoenix Martial Arts. Yeah. (laughs) Was it was it like overnight that you did that? Was there a gap? No gap. No No gap. gap. That's they. So they, you know, I think they took offense. They thought I had it planned, but I did. I've had my name planned since I was fourteen. Um, but I didn't plan on not being with that organization Mm. at the time. I actually thought we were going to work it out. And then again, we just couldn't come to, um, negotiations, Mm. you know, professor Nolte, an amazing teacher he was, and and we just couldn't do it. I, I, I don't want to pick at that subject more than you're willing to. Are you willing to at least like what was the general area of disconnect was it training was it finances where where was it you know as you're starting a family i'd have to say there was there was finances okay uh, it was 100 finances um you know again there was i i did a lot for the organization i felt mm-hmm. i did a lot for the organization but i also felt they did a lot for me because i put in that extra time and effort so i don't take away anything that they gave me either but when it came to the financial part, I was, I think I was just getting engaged mm. or I was about to propose to my wife at the time. And um, I couldn't, I wanted to renegotiate our original terms because our my school had gotten much better. Yeah. It, you know, and, you know, we had proceeded and, I, and it just wasn't going to happen. 
you know, and I, and I understood that. And they, I, I hope they understand it now. <laughs> it's, it's interesting how money ends up being such a, a, it can be a divisive issue. You know, if, if you, if you look around, you've certainly been around long enough. You've heard stories all over the place. It's, it's a thing that when you get excited, I mean, we, we, we didn't talk much about the school where you were 50, 50. I can only imagine that money played a role in that too. You know, that never even got off the floor. Oh, that, really? Okay. That literally got my, my stuff in the door, the heavy bags in there. And then he basically acted like he was the boss. Oh, and you said, and, I'm out. and I realized the very second that happened, it just wasn't going to roll. He was in a keto master. So he was going to have a keto on one night and I was going to do my Kempo on the other side mm-hmm. at the other nights. But it was a, he, he made it very clear that he was in charge. Mm. And so I didn't even step. We never even, I never got a single student in the door on that one. Oh, bummer. But maybe not. Oh, yeah. No, not, you know, Pro- it, probably it, for the them best. All, them all got torn down a couple years later anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, it's, I, I do want to just point out it before we move on, you know, when anytime somebody gets into a partnership, whether it's professional or, or even romantic, it's really easy to just kind of say, you know what, that we'll be fine. It'll be fine. We don't need to unpack this now. And yet statistically business partnerships work out, don't work out the divorce rates well over 50%. It usually doesn't work out, but how much more likely would it be if, we saw those things and said, you know, let's figure out a plan now. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like from what you're saying, there could have been a way forward if there was some kind of mutually beneficial way. How do, how do we, how do we end up that we both stand or fall together? Those are the, in my opinion, the, it's the heart of a good business relationship. I agree. I think it's difficult. You know, at at one time I had a second school, Mm. um, an amazing teacher. He's still an amazing teacher and school owner. And we had a business proposition. He started doing phenomenal. I didn't want to fall into the same tracks that mm. I was with my other organization. So I said, he came to me and he says, this isn't working. I need this. And I said, I think that's great. Great idea. You can have that. You're doing mm. all this hard work. The next year, same thing happened. He was still doing ama- doing even better. He says, this doesn't financially work for me. I said, you're absolutely right. You deserve more. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and we did a handshake agreement and I never... Went back on anything we'd ever agreed upon. In fact, and I gave him more, you know, as we went through instead of being greedy about it. Cause that was, I'm sure he wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to start yeah. a family at some point in time. And and now he's doing really great and successful. And I'm happy for him. We broke ways after mm-hmm. he bought the school off me, which was part of our negotiations. He had his own mindset and mm-hmm. I had mine. And I told him, you need to go and do your thing. And you know, and he did it. And it's been great yeah. for him. Well, so let's I, talk. I, I made sure we separated that one, mm-hmm. right? But I want to talk about that for a second because there's okay. there's the financial arrangement there, but there's also a student teacher relationship there. You know, we're mm-hmm. so used to as as people as not you know separate from martial arts, we reach certain age and we go off on our own generally, right? And if if you knew anything about the history of humanity, you know that there are traditions in every culture <laughs> about becoming an adult. And yet, we're like the, changing the M and the N in Kempo. When each pe- when, when each generation leads to their teacher, and they change the letter. <laughs> I I don't know. I, I don't think I'll offend you with this. I don't think no. I know of a more useless argument in the world of martial arts than whether Kempo has an M or an N. I, <laughs> because correct me if I'm wrong, that is not a term that started. In English, that's a term that started with a whole different alphabet with sounds that aren't exactly like what we do in English. Am, am I right? Correct. Okay. You are correct. All right. Uh, so we're talking about the term that I understand is called transliteration. And right. arguing over a transliteration just seems silly. They, when I, I joke all the time saying if I could just, if, if I knew how to, people knew how to pronounce it, it would just be K-E question mark P-O. Hand, Craig laughs about it all the time when I say it. I'm like, yeah. and I'll type when I type to him or something, I'll say, you know, I just type in the question mark in the middle just for fun. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, to, to be clear, I understand that there are lineages where um, 
it becomes a distinguishing factor. You know, it is Kempo here, and then this branch is Kenpo, and this branch is Kempo. And so it can have some relevance, but I've seen people who really get wrapped around the axle on whether it's an M or an N. <laughs> when they really get wrapped up on who's right, and I've talked to some really brilliant people on it, and and I think I find it fascinating. I'll stick to what I believe, or, you know, and I've always... You know, the chem with the M was the soft. The Ken with the N was the hard. Ken, you know, that was one way of, you know, familiarizing or getting them differentiated from each other. But then if you look down the lineage line, it literally is like each person just left their teacher and switched the letter. It was as simple as that. Like so many things, it's, okay, I want to do it this way. Now I need to come up with a reason. Yeah. You know, reverse engineering in there. So let's let's go back. So no, okay. not not whether it's Kempo or Kenpo. <laughs> yes. But it sounds like it and and may, maybe maybe time makes it a little bit clearer, but it sounds like as your student running your second location progressed as not only a school owner but a martial artist, there was a a mutual recognition, maybe not desire, but at least recognition that it was time for him to go off on his own, you know, it's time for him to fend for himself, to learn the lessons of standing or falling on his own that you also did that Professor Duncan permitted you to have that Mm -hmm. so many of us have had as an opportunity. And yet in the world of martial arts, that is the point that probably of, of higher ranks creates the most problems this desire to say no you are you are my student you were you are mine this possession almost or did you see what you just did how you gripped yeah, your hand or, like that yeah that that made it and i really wish i could remember if it was ed parker jr or you know master chun jr when they explained to me like if you want to foster somebody you keep your hand open mm. and all the sand will stay in your hand if you tighten that grip on it and tighten your grip around the people, the sand just starts leaking out around your knuckles and your fists. And that just always metaphor. made sense to me. It's like, I'll try to hold you up as I best I can. Yeah. I'm not going to put that grip on it. And Professor Duncan, sure, he always said, you're not going to open up a Duncan's martial arts. You do your own thing. Don't be like me. <laughs> right. Because you can't be no better than him at being him. You can be no way. you and right. crush it, but you've got to be you. Got to be me. Absolutely. And it's not easy. You know, it's, it's an ego thing. And it, but it, what's the whole point of you? You know, you kind of contradict yourself. If you sit there and say you're developing students to become these like to become the best they can be as long as they're underneath me. Right. But it's right. garbage. It's gar- I don't I'd rather see them sitting next to me, you know, at the same table with me, not in some, you know, that's that makes no sense to me. <laughs> Never has. I always, you know, it's. They, they, people have to go and follow their dreams and do their thing, even if it goes against what you know everyone else thinks you should do or or anything like that. Right. We've had a recurring theme on the show over the last few months: this notion that what I, I believe uh, an instructor of anything, their primary goal should be that their students surpass them. Correct. Because if their students don't surpass them, they are less than them. And if you carry that out, martial arts just gets really bad. Like it gets worse if that's the path you take. But the other way, martial arts continues to progress, to evolve. And I think on the surface, everyone would say that they want that. But not everyone, as you said, their ego is able to permit them supporting that. Uh, A continuous theme in my dojo is, uh, as I say to some of this, I'm explaining it to my students. And I'll sit there and say, this isn't how I did it when when I learned it at your age. Right. And I said to him, well, the point is, I've got 35 years of experience now. So think about this. What I'm teaching you now took me 35 years to learn. Right. And you're learning it on your second year <laughs> or you're learning it on your third year. It is impossible for you not to be better than me 30 years from now. Right. Impossible. If, you know, it, tr- you know, doing tradition for tradition's sake is foolish. Yeah. You know, traditions are there. They're part of our history. But just to do it. Like I'm wearing a shirt right now that's from our, you know, it's a, it's a big shirt. It's, you know, the Fall 7, Rise 8 type mm. thing. It's part of our whole curriculum, you know, part of Karazempo in our family lineage line. It's been on it. And it's part of our, you know, boom. Yep. <laughs> and that's something we talk about. It's fall down, get back up. Have that yeah. dragon spirit. Have your phoenix spirit. Get up. <laughs> One of the things I, I've had happen in, in my own 
personal martial arts journey a couple times and and I'm I'm guessing that this has occurred for you and that's why I'm bringing up I want to talk about it for you. Mm-hmm. I've had circumstances where I have quote taught things to my instructors, things that I brought in from other training or things that I figured out or questions that ended up them saying I hadn't thought of that tell me more of what you're thinking and it's a really telling dynamic that an instructor is willing to learn from a student have you had that have have you taught professor duncan and have your students taught you always i hit the one thing we said was you know try to get through black belt get to black belt with what we're doing you know get that down you got your basics and then you go out professor duncan used to pay for me 18 and 19 17 years of age to go to seminars Mm. he'd be like i'm going out of town I need to go. I need to know what this seminar is about. You're going to go <laughs> and you're going to come back and show me what you did. Yeah. And, and absolutely. I, we, I'm always bouncing stuff off of him and he's bouncing stuff off of me and asking me questions. So 100, and I do the same thing with my people. If I have, if I have a wrestler coming into the dojo, well, I'm not teaching wrestling that day. I don't care how old they're, they're teaching right. wrestling that day and they're going to show me more things. You know, it's a, absolutely. I always try to find that thing that other people can bring to benefit our whole school. That's not me, you know, that that's them because they are part of the school. Yeah. Yeah. It it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this one way dynamic of knowledge falling. Knowledge is knowledge defies gravity. Knowledge is, is space. It's energy. It fills right. Wherever the, wherever you permit the openings to be, it will flow. Right. I love it. Right. What do you love most about teaching? What do I love most about teaching? I got, oh. I, <laughs> I didn't think I that was going to be so a hard thing. one. Holy cow. That's so, you know, you know, if I were you know, go with, I love showing, I love getting people to the same love and enjoyment as I have for it. I, I love when I can make somebody look at what we're doing or what I'm teaching and their smile shoot across their face and they see the joy that I'm giving off. They absorb that joy. They're having the fun and the joy in it. You know, that's more the adult perspective of it. But kids to adults, I love when I can see a, a, a line when you see the confidence drop, jump up. Right. Like I, I love when all of a sudden they're, they're the I can's to the I did's, you know, and, and I love seeing people realize there's so much more that they can do that they, that they realize than they realize, you know, that's a big one for me having those kids, especially right now, just getting the kids to talk up or even like play tag. Sometimes they're so used to not touching for the last couple of years that it's, they don't even know how to wrestle. You know, I'm getting so many different things to just to have that interaction again and seeing the pure, energetic joy and then having no clue what to do and then bounce into each other because they don't know spatial awareness anymore <laughs> right so it's I, I love all of it. it it's it's been the joy of watching these kids just improve themselves it was a teaching you know teaching kids you know non-athletes sometimes become you know teaching your future athletes now <laughs> yep I, I find when for instructors that work with kids especially as long as you have there are a few that they that really stick out over the years. Somebody that came in in a certain way, and maybe they're still teach uh, training. Uh, maybe they left after a few years, but they made a really strong impression on you. And and I'm you probably have a bunch of those, but I'm just the smile on your face tells me that you might be willing to share one. There's somebody you might be thinking of. Well, I always had, you know, there's always one this. Yes, <laughs> I've got many. You know what it is? It's great, though, because I've had, you know, in my school, we have three six degree black belts, two fifth degree black cool. belts. I, I have the parents of the kids who came in 23 years ago, 24 years ago, who started with their kids. Mm-hmm. The kids are all off from college, have jobs and have their own kids now. And those parents are still with me. And I'm the same age they were when they started. Yeah. And I've learned so much from them and they're still in there, you know, every one of them's in there once or twice a week in their sixties mm-hmm. and their fifties. So they, they, it's hard because they're there, but I have this one kid, his name was Max mm-hmm. and he was just the superstar. And everyone always knows I talk about Max a lot. Um, he ended up becoming vice president of a really big company in Boston. He won mm-hmm. like a, a Dubai award for an invention that helps with ADD, ADHD. Um, 
but he, he was super great. He was an 11 year old who adults respected 12 year old mm-hmm. that adults would listen to because he talked very similar to the way I would talk to the adults and the kids. He just had a mannerism and he's just gone on to have some unbelievable success. Mm. Um, I wish he had stayed longer, but at the same time, I'm glad he didn't because he wouldn't have been right. where he is now. Right. right. So he made it up really hard and fast and he worked hard. He was one of those 11 year old, 10 year old kids who were doing the 10 hours a week kind of training. Cool. And I've got one of those right now too. His name's Isaac and he's off the college, but he was doing the same thing. 10 and 11 reminds me a lot of Max doing the 10, 11 hours a week at young ages, just because he wanted to be there. Loved it. Like and myself. That, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, I was 20 hours a week at, by age 14. 20? How did you have time for 20? Uh, five where hours where was day, it? Were you cutting school? We've actually heard I, from people who cut school to go train, but I don't think that was you. So we're, our classes were four to nine. Okay. And I would get off the bus. I'd jump on my bike. I'd ride down, have my key in my hand. I'd get there before professor sometimes. So I'd unlock the door. And at nine o'clock, my parents come pick me up. And that was Monday through Thursday. And then I had a real job on Saturday and Sunday at a restaurant. When did you do your homework? <laughs> Wasn't the best scholar, <laughs> but my parents knew where I was. <laughs> I, I will say, and I tell it to my students all the time, I, I really detested high school and middle school and elementary school. I wasn't a rule follower because I had so many responsibilities put on me at a young age that I didn't understand having to have a hallway pass to go to the bathroom. I, I struggled with those things at a young age when I'm home alone for a couple of days a month at a younger age because my parents work so much. Right. But yeah, I made it to my job every day. I never missed school. You know, and I had to have a, a bathroom pass. <laughs> right. So I, I did not have an awesome, but I got lucky. I got into college and I did excel in college because that was on me. Once mm-hmm. the responsibility was 100% on me, go to class, don't go to class, show up, don't show up, pay me the money. I graduated with honor. So, I mean, it was oh, a right much different world. <laughs> How much do you think what you learned in school about being a social worker applies in what you do now? Every interview I have right now, I talk about my social work degree. Yeah. So every time a new student comes in, with the parents and the students, because we talk about a couple different things, you know, self-defense, physical fitness, and mental awareness, you know, mm-hmm. the I can's and the I can't attitude. Then I also talk about my social work and how we are, we're trying to uplift, you know, we've got to uplift, uplift the spirits, you know, it's a correct, you know, we're going to correct you, but we're going to make sure we praise you. It's not just going to be crack, 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 crack. There's got to be some praising and we got to find where their value is and what they're great at and not compare them to anybody else. Yeah. So... Well, and that great. was not always the way because I, you know, Professor Duncan will always allow me to have other teachers. Um, and that was very uncommon because all the teachers that he allowed me to have would in turn within a few years, four to five years, turn around and say, you're no longer allowed to train with Professor Duncan. And I would laugh. I'd give a nice handshake and I'd tell you, I appreciate all your time. And I'd go back because I never went into an agreement with an instructor without them knowing that I had permission from Professor Duncan. And they always said, that's great. I think that's awesome. And then it would change a few years later. <laughs> Why is that so common? I have my theories, but I want to hear from you. I, one was straight to the point. Okay. Um, and I did appreciate that it was hard pill to swallow. Uh, Master Chun Jr. was very straight to the point about it. He was never rude. He loves Professor Duncan. But he is a very straight to the point teacher where he said, if you're going to learn my way, and you want to survive and live through the feist teaching it my way, you can't have any misconceptions by doing it a different way. And then halfway in the heat of the moment, your body or your mind flip flops. And I liked how he stated that. I was like, I could take that. It's not how I am, who I am. Right. But I could accept that. There's a lot of things that he had always talked about. Him and I were very close for a while. We talked on the phone all the time. I went to all of his seminars. He was at my school quite a few times. He had a huge influence in the power buildup and the history of the martial arts for me. But he had at least a point. The other people just didn't like being second or equal to somebody else. Yeah. So, uh, you here. know, you can't have two, you know, can't have two master instructors. It just didn't. Mm. I didn't. <laughs> so I always had a professor and he's always been my life coach, my martial arts coach, my, my social worker. <laughs> right. How do you handle that so, for your students? Are you as encouraging? Say, no, you're like, you, you mentioned, I think you said three, you have three six downs. So you must yes. be, if they're still 
with you and training with you, you you're probably kicking them out from time to time. Go over there and do that. Like go go do something. Go do this. Go see that person. Absolutely. One of one of my instructors is a fifth degree. He goes and does tai chi every week. Mm-hmm. Um, a few of the guys they don't. Again, they're they're older now. They are in their later fifties, early sixties. Sixty seven is one of them. Cool. Um, no, they're not training elsewhere right now. Okay. They're happy to be in there, moving their bones. You know, coming in there, having fun again, trying to give back to what they can. Not you know, and and that's that. But one hundred percent. I want my black belts. I want all my students. I want them at the martial arts symposium. Mm-hmm. We used to go to the Saratoga festival where I've met yep. some great instructors there. Um, I want them to go and explore. I'm, that's why I bring in people all the time too. I'm always bringing in a guest instructor probably twice a year, different arts, different styles, different mentalities. Some I love, some don't come back. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> True story. So, but no, they, it, Kempo's the mutt system. So we got to make sure that we keep that, that mutt fresh. <laughs> It's so funny that you 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 say it that way. You know, to me, every martial arts system is is it's an amalgamation. It's a you know, if you want to call it a mutt, you can call it a mutt. Yeah. It, it, somebody somewhere along the line said, "Okay, I'm choosing these things and excluding these things." Doing, I'm mean, doing it right now. And then the idea, actually, I've heard some, I've heard some tell about this. And then <laughs> anything. When anybody says, you know, this is how it has to be, and they try and they take what to me is a very natural and organic process. I like this. I don't like this. This works for me. This doesn't work for me. I want to teach this. I don't want to teach that. And then they put a very rigid line around it. They put it in a box and say it cannot be changed. It seems so contradictory to me. Well, before the internet, they used to tell us that the combinations in our system can never be changed because those are the direct movements that were taught directly from the temple and you can never change the combinations. Oh, this is the, the 108. Yes. Yeah. That was a story that was passed down to us pre-internet, you know, the tempos we can manipulate the open hand tech, but the combinations, mm. those were set in stone and <laughs> Except for you know, it's two a good story, isn't it? They're different, <laughs> right? Right. It's a big game of telephone. Wait, we we have the same master, you know, two degrees up, and you do this this way, and I do it this way. Who's right? Well, now genius. So I'll say this: genius. I didn't hear him say this until about in the two thousands. He might have said it earlier, but I didn't hear it publicly said. Grandmaster Valari said that the combinations were all different. Because it was the 12 rings of Kempo. And each combination had 12 sections. Now, I thought this was a genius kind of thing, too, because it goes back to a lot of the old story theories. Even Grandmaster Basari, Professor Kimo, they would have 20 techniques. You had to do 20 different ways. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have way more than just 20 techniques. But he said it was the 12 rings of Kempo, and all of them together created the whole system of Shaolin, is what I heard them saying in the 2000s. I thought it was, again, I don't know. 100% 100% could be it's, part of it. I'm not part of it, but I, I kind of enjoyed listening to that thought, that it, theory of it too. At the, least there was the, thought put into it. Yeah. Yeah. The last yeah. thing I'm going to do is is say anything that could even be inferred as speaking poorly of, of a man who oh. now has passed away, right? I mean, like he's Absolutely never going to be not. on the show, which bums me out incredibly. But I, I think, you know, what I think is more interesting than what is said there is why is it said? Because we all want to be part of something, right? Like we want to feel part of that lineage to say, you know, these techniques are what came out of the Shaolin temple, however many years ago, that's like, it gives us a sense of belonging. And I think that that's something that a lot of us really don't have these days. And I agree with that. But now, I mean, we can all admit that those techniques did not come out of the Shaolin temple, (laughs) but... There, there may Again, uh, there so, are probably a few people listening going wait what yes, no i'm sure i disagree and i and i was the same way before you know the internet right so, <laughs> and and it's again I, I i don't trash when people ask me what the best system is or when people will call me it's like what school is the best school or town or even when i'm on my public forums in my own town i always say all the schools in town are great you need to figure out what instructor meets your needs and fits best right. with your kid I, I mean, I don't trash any of the systems. I think every one of them has benefits. Mm-hmm. And again, I think it's really the, the the teachers. You know, what's the the teachers' thought process? What are what are their intentions? Right. 
I, I have yeah. long said that for for one martial arts school owner to trash another school owner is to say I would rather someone not train than to train with that person because ultimately that's what happens. Mm-hmm. There, there are areas, and you know, you, you might even be aware of them, where all the instructors throw shade at the other instructors. And all that does is create a culture in the area of people saying, I'm afraid afraid to make a bad decision, so I'm just not going to train. That's right. where that leads. And I think that that's such a bummer because even, even the worst instructor I've ever had for me had people for whom they were the right instructor. Absolutely. I, I've i had instructors that no one wanted to go to. They didn't like their demeanor. Sure. They, they couldn't handle being called something or other. Yeah. Right. Uh, I wasn't there for um, spiritual guidance at the time. <laughs> I was there for some martial guidance at the time. And, you know, it's, you can pick and choose. I've always, I've tend to train out of state a lot with a lot of my mm-hmm. teachers that I find on the road mm-hmm. that have something to offer that I haven't seen and then make sense, mm-hmm. you know, and that was something that I always was going for. I have what I taught my students, but I was always searching for, what I needed to fulfill in my own martial arts needs to get to me to where I am almost at, you know, I'll never be completed, but I, you know, keep filling in holes that I feel that I have. And I've always had to do that in different systems. So I've always trained outside the system. Right. Speak to that concept, because that's very, very similar to a metaphor I use about martial arts training and rounding out and everything. Never be filled. Yeah. So, you know, if I, if I'm feeling real confident on one game, I'm realizing within a week or two that I'm really lacking in another game. And I want to know why, or how come if I'm looking at, the obi you know, the, the flexible weapon techniques and the belt techniques or something. There's there's some great things in there. I was very weak in it, so I wanted to train with somebody who obviously was great. So I was in the Filipino arts doing it, and then I found a Japanese instructor who was unbelievable at it, who I was like, wait a second, a Japanese instructor is going to be rocking the flexible weapons? And I had never seen it done that way, and it was amazing, mm. right? So I so all right, well, I found who I'm going to go train in Virginia with right now, and you know, I travel to Virginia all the time. So it just, because it's for me, when you know, the last person who created their system before me was able to figure out what they needed for themselves and pass it on, but it wouldn't always mean that it was what I needed. So, you know. Absolutely. For you, yeah. I mean, is that the same? Like, Yeah, it, well, I, I think for me, one of the most empowering realizations was there is so much to know even if you forget about being cross style, there is so much to know. There are literally not enough hours in the day for me to forget, progress, maintain all of my skills in everything. Oh yeah. I always have to set down something. It's like, okay, uh, my forms are going to regress over the next year or two years or six months or whatever, because I'm spending more time focused on sparring or self-defense or 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 right and Mm -hmm. it can be really easy to say well no that's not going to happen but i've never heard anyone who's been training for decades disagree with this the people who disagree with this are the people who don't realize how much there is that they don't know that's right when you talk about an event like the symposium and for for those who may not be familiar with that event terry dow who's been a guest on the show, um, top student under Bill Wallace, puts on this wonderful, wonderful event. And, and that's where you and I met, was at the symposium. Mm-hmm. And yes. it's a bunch of different instructors doing a bunch of different things in a bunch of different ways. And it's a heck of a lot of fun. But it does not take very long for you training with a, other people to go, oh, oh, oh. And, 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 and I come out of those events going, okay, I'm already training. I, there, there was one day, you know, Jeff Driscoll, who we have not oh, had yes. on the show, but a wonderful instructor. And he's I awesome. had, I've had, I had to school a few times. He's, he's just awesome. He's great. And I had to yes. sit down and say, okay, he's in Pennsylvania. I could do that. But at the time I was training in four schools. The idea of adding a fifth, I was like, nope, we've got to put this one on hold. This isn't going to happen right now. Yeah. Because there, you, there's only so much time. There are only so many hours in the day. That, that's it's and you better pick wisely that time because you're not going to get it back that's right yeah time's the only thing you can't make more of that's right that's it's one thing that i took a 
took a while into my adult years to figure out, but it became very real. I was like, you know what? You're right. I can't get that time back. I can make more money. I can start a new career. I can do this, this, and this, but I'm not going to be able to spend that time with my family again. I'm not going to be able to spend that time with my, you know, myself going out being with me time, right. you know? So yeah, 100% on that. As someone who's trained with a bunch of different people and was not only permitted, but encouraged to do so very, very early on. And as you said, at a time when few people did, mm -hmm. how do you decide who is, and eh, it, it's the right word, but it carries, it carries something with it. So forget the, the tone who is worthy for you to learn from who is worthwhile for you to become a student under. I like that. Um, when they answer the question, you know, because a good instructor is going to ask you, what are you looking for? Right. right? You know, if I'm, if I'm searching out and talk, talking to people, I, there was a time I was looking to hit better. I wanted mm. to punch better <laughs> in boxing. I've done boxing. I want, so I asked certain instructors, you know, what is the method if, or realistically when they hit me, mm. how that hit felt going, Ooh, I haven't been hit like that before. How did you do that? And when they could actually repeat the same thing over and over again, it, it was, you know, you knew there was more depth there. The, you know, I want, I was always looking for depth. Um, I went on a big history crusade for like a decade where I was just wanted to figure out Kempo. You know, I wanted to go all the way back to the roots. And, mm. you know, of course, you just got a bajillion paths of people leading you in all different directions. It was very difficult. Right. But I wanted, for my understanding of where our lineage came from, it was just, it was a need for me. And I felt like I fulfilled a lot of that need. Um, but in that process, because of that knowledge, I got to meet one of my one of, one of my people that influenced me a lot, Hanchi Anthony, because he had a a moon and a mountain, a mountain moon patch. All right. So of course, what do I do? I say to this guy when I'm much younger, I'm like, oh, Professor Serio, <laughs> you know, or and he goes, oh, he went, oh, sit down. He wasn't saying, oh, because I said Professor Serio. He just said uh because he thought i was some dumb kempo guy mm. and so you go sit down we're all at a saratoga event and he's like all right so what do you know about this patch and i said something he goes all right so then he started asking me all these lineage questions and i was able to answer them and he looked at me again so he delved a little deeper and then he delved a little deeper and he goes so you're not some dumb kempo guy so yeah, i'll be careful <laughs> what i say yeah you know you're not some just you know and so you know a little bit so because of that I then went to his workout the next day and I didn't know him at all. And I went to his training session the next day and I didn't go to a single other training session except for uh, Doug Markaita's session that weekend. Mm -hmm. So I just followed this person, Hanchi Anthony, around the whole time. And, and he wowed me. He was doing things that, you know, that magical stuff, except the pain was left with marks and screams, right? So there wasn't, <laughs> and he was doing it to us and he was very just down to earth. He had a background. That was very legit. Mm. And he wasn't the same person as everyone around here. That's the other thing is, a, you know, a lot of us are all training the same thing here in New England. Then we're all just kind of repeating the same thing to each other, mm. which I do love. I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm part of a few groups up here. Mm -hmm. We kind of, we, we're going over that repeated stuff. And I like that. But if I want new stuff, not, you know, or something that may be completely off, but the same, I had to go outside, right? You know, so if I, when I wanted to indulge my Kung Fu side of Shaolin Kempo, I was on the phone with Sifu Sharif Bay all the time. You know, we were doing seminars with him and, and, you know, the Shaolin Kempo part from Thumai is a lot of hangar, mm -hmm. you know, and then I always had my stick fighting. So in our Kempo has a lot of stick fighting and it just hidden with the, you know, the empty hands. So it, it, it was great. I, I like going outside the source. So almost to connect, what I already knew, but didn't know how to say it properly. Mm. Or if I can get multiple ways of doing the same thing with different ways of explaining how it's done, it helps when I'm teaching because it gives better triggers to the students. That that was another reason. I always mm. liked that. You mentioned, you know, going down a rabbit hole for for a while on history. Yeah. Is there a rabbit hole now? No. No? Not Weird. for history, is that what you mean? No, no, but is there something oh, okay. else like, no, that you're that, <laughs> that you're exploring? You know, is there you talked about it as kind of holes, you know, what some people might say, yeah. you know, the weaker parts of your quote game. Where I are you spending the time? Right now? I, I am feeling 
um, the material overload, mm. in my opinion, is what I call it. That's happened, and and I think it's that part of letting go too. You know, the tradition for tradition's sake. The I don't want to change something. Who am I to change something? Type thing. And I think my biggest thing is I think we're professionals that we've been doing this for a long time. That's who we are to change things. I think we've got a lot of time in the game to be able to change things. We feel something new has come to light. Um, I mean, when Grandmaster Passara came here, there was roughly 17 to 20 techniques and four forms. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go up the next generation, more forms, more techniques. You go to the next generation, you got 108 techniques and what, 20 something forms. You go to the next generation. Now we've got added Kempo punch techniques. Now, where are they getting all this stuff from? They're cross training, right? Right. They're cross training and they're bringing in new stuff, but they're not right. getting rid of some, the repetitive stuff. And if, if I may, this is something that has been a pretty big realization for me just over maybe a year, probably not even that long. When they went from four forms to more forms, are each of those forms as good as when there were only four or is it diluting the time and the quality of each of those forms is actually lessened uh, i think we could struggle on all that because how diluted are those forms when they were taught in 1960 i don't mean diluted in terms of no, accuracy no, i, I just, mean <laughs> i know what skill. you mean yeah grandmaster Vasari would say i can just do one kata for the rest of my life and be a master of one kata and be able to fight by just doing that one form you know what is it a I, I fear the man that does one thing a thousand times instead of the person that does a thousand things once. Right? I, I just, I, I agree with that. But I, I think as a business, as mm. martial arts is a business, culture defined the business. And what culture did we have in the 70s and 80s? Shaolin. You had Kung Fu on TV. You had David Carradine. So all of a sudden, Kempo became Shaolin Kempo. Right? And all the Kung Fu stuff came in. And then we had a period of time, say, let's say late 80s, 90s, where getting better at the material wasn't the key. It was who had the most material. And, and now who can memorize the most things and do it and look good? And now we don't have that because there's so much material that we're not really getting good at any of the material. And, and that's my struggle city right now. And I look back to the old roots of the Kempo. It, you know, you go back to the Kaju and everything, Kaju Kenpo, you you had the judo, you had the jujitsu, you had the locks, you had the throws, you had the boxing, you had the stick fighting. That's where our roots are. Hmm. Why aren't we doing all those? Again, fortunate, Professor Duncan was a judo guy. We always did judo throws. You know, so I he was a jet he was a goju guy before Kenpo, so we could do the harder forms. Mm -hmm. and not just, you know, so we, we had that I had that ability, luckily for me. Right. But we need to go back. I need to go back to that <laughs> uh, for my own because I want what's best for what I think is best for my students right now. And right now, what I think is best for my students is not memorizing a bajillion techniques, but throwing some gloves on, feeling confident, hitting that bag and feeling confident, being able to go through the partner drills and also, you know, tangling it up on the floor. Yeah. The, the deeper I get in my training, the more I believe that it is what, what I broadly classify as free form movement whether it's mm -hmm. sparring in in any way or randori or rolling <laughs> self-defense anything where the input and the output the the attack and the response are undefined you know you can still have parameters at, in times but that's where all the good stuff is when you mm -hmm. give people the opportunity to kind of figure it out and if you've got if you're saddling them with 65 forms and 242 combinations and all these other things that they have to do. When do they have time? <laughs> Not everybody's going to train 20 hours a week. Well, that's it. I could do it, but I was putting in a year's worth of training every month almost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's a difference of two hours a week versus 20. Yeah. What, and that's what I think we as the school owners forget we're like the, the what, 5% of the people, 1% of the students who's going to continue on. So of course it worked for us. We, that's what we were and are right. D like different breed. 
different breeds. And when I'm sitting there in my own head for years, I go, I don't understand why this doesn't make sense to you. This is easy. Just do it. You know, and I'm like, oh, wait, you've only been here twice a week. <laughs> oh, wait, you have a job. Which is, you know, which is great, but I want to be able to make sure I can pack that in. Yeah. To twice a week. And I want them to get the best of it. Now, I, I still love my forms. I still love my weapons and I still love doing a lot of my combinations and Kempos. Um, but I had to, you know, almost pick and choose which ones at this time are best for the students to work on. What's going to correlate? Am I going to show them a form because it looks pretty or can I show them a form and then with, you know, draw out the techniques and movements in it. So it's not just wasted movement, but it's repetitive repetition of movement for a purpose. Yeah. I, you know, I think of it as, core curriculum which is the stuff mm -hmm. that everybody no matter what is of importance to you in martial arts you know in this style this system is necessary it's the thing nobody's going to argue over anyway right like we all need to know how to punch and do these few kicks and whatever and then you have what i what i refer to as extended curriculum stuff that it all has value yeah but maybe it doesn't all have equal value to everyone correct i, I like that yeah i just uh, so much. This is so. <laughs> it, it, it's and it's plus. You're also changing a pattern. You know, I got to change my thinking, mm -hmm. and it's it's more. It's harder for me to change that thinking than it is for somebody, my student, to go okay, because they've never seen it differently. Right. Um, Are you enjoying this process? Yes and no. Okay. Would life be simpler if I just followed the plan? Yes, but would it be fulfilling? No. Hmm. Um, I, I do, I, you know what? I am enjoying it and I just got to realize what are the, one of the, my friends will say, you know, ready, ready, fire, aim, right? Ready, fire, aim. And I just got to get it going and then kind of help it. I, I got to realize it's not going to be perfect. And then the pe people I teach are going to have to change it mm -hmm. and have to make it better and see where my gaps and my flaws were. But that um, makes them part of that process and they will learn correct. something through that, that, you know, the students who come after won't learn. They're going to have a better understanding of the why because they've seen the contrast. That's right. Like I my after cool. black belt training for myself is really strictly based on what Professor Duncan's created for his style of martial arts. So I'm really in his forms are the fighting techniques mm. and the concept. So I, you know, I make sure I'm really working his material so that I have it down for when I, you know, when he's not sharing it anymore. Right. So, but you know, these kids are going to, it's going to be great. I, I am excited I, yeah. and I really, and I, and I enjoy the teaching method because it goes along to a method that we're taught before was it didn't matter. There's no such thing as an advanced technique. And that's been one of the hardest things for a lot of my friends to ever understand was one of my instructor, um, Hanshi Anthony would always say there, there's no such thing as an advanced technique, just an advanced practitioner. You can't tell me that you're from ball kick is the same as that white belt's from ball kick, right? Like, and that's a very basic kick. But when you hit somebody, you're going to be able to tell, you know, you should be able to manipulate that body to where it's going to land. Right. Where the white belt's just going to flare it out. Maybe you know, is over, a yeah. throw an advanced technique in Kempo? I guess. But is it an advanced technique in Judo? No. It's only advanced because something has to come first. And you right. look at and it. And what system are we doing? You know, or you know, that's it, if I'm doing this system, I'm going to be doing that a lot more than this, right? So, right. it's it's true. There's a lot of truth in that. So when I'm teaching my hopeful new way of doing it, is they're all in the same area of le they're at the same level, mm -hmm. learning the same techniques at the same time. Some of them are just going to be a little better than others, and those people should be at that level in a year from now. It's not a new concept. It's just newer for me to teach it that way. Yeah. <laughs> So let's say it's 10 years from now and we bring you back on and, and somehow I haven't seen you in between now and then. And I say, Jesse, what's, what's been going on with you and your training and your school and just your martial arts life since I last talked to you? What would you hope you were telling me a decade from now? A decade from now. What I'd love to be telling you is that I've... Uh, made some students and people feel how i felt about the love for the arts and they want to move on and teach it themselves and they would be running the school my school or in other schools mm -hmm. or something like that again on you know being fair about everything but i would love to be able to 
in 10 years from now, I would love to be able to sit back and have, you know, more managerial <laughs> things and seeing what I've created and, and how they've taken to it. Mm. Uh, you know, I want to see people be successful. I, you know, it's taken me a long time to go from a nonprofit school in Syracuse teaching in the inner city um, with government grants and everything like that to, you know, after a long time feeling comfortable in my business. And, you know, I'm feeling comfortable in the systems and feeling really great with everyone surrounding me too. Yeah. And and that's another thing. And I love being surrounded by the people that I have right now in the school, outside of the school. And, and that's just been something huge for me is surrounding myself with the right people, elevating me. And as I'm being elevated, I want my students to feel that elevation. You know, I want to break, I want them, I want everyone to come up with me. <laughs> mm. Well said, well said. Well, we, we've got a bunch of different people who are going to be paying attention to this, you know, different schools, different countries, different systems, levels of training, reasons for training. What would you say to that group, that group of everyone? Keep training, keep working on what you think is your core, and then see what you can, you know, but then don't be afraid to think outside and look outside the core because it can only improve it. You know, if you find something, again, it might not be a new technique, but it could be a new way of expressing it or hearing it that makes yours better. You, you'll be able to fine tune it even more. There's, there's always ways, you know, I found that if I'm trying to learn a technique that's part, might be a hard style. And I talked to a Kung Fu guy and all of a sudden, oh, there it is. I didn't have that piece of it. You know, oh, wait a second. There was a spiral motion in that straightforward linear motion too. You know, there was... You know, you had to find both. So stick to what you believe is working for you, but never be afraid to explore outside of that and to improve yourself because you don't have it yet. You don't know it yet. You're not the best you can be yet. <laughs> and, and But you're only going to work for it. You know, you got to just keep working for the best you can be. And the only way to do that is by exploring and training and doing new and different things too and perfecting your whole and honing in on your art. If people want to get a hold of you, how would they uh, do that? You can go Social to our media, or website, Dragon Cage Martial Arts, Facebook. Um, if anyone really wants to reach out to me, my email address is shehandwire at gmail.com. Um, but I'm definitely accessible on Facebook. I'm right out there. Okay. Look me up. Uh, you're going to send a friend request, so make sure you kind of tag how we know or what we know, okay. because I don't, it, it's a going from a personal to a business page, but it's still, it's yep. in between. So I'm watching who I'm allowing on it also. True. But yeah, I love sharing everything. I love sharing the knowledge and listening to other people and their stories and, and going through it and what their training was. And, and I guess sharing and expressing a little bit of mine right now in more of an open forum is definitely different. But I, I do. I love it. You know, just like going to the symposium. I love, you know, you see me on the floor. I love mm -hmm. you know, once that game face is on, it's usually the same smile face, too. You know, and enjoying every second of the mo you know, the moment. You know, keep doing that, you know, 2022 to 2023, everyone just keep enjoying the moment. I appreciate anyone who's willing to come on here and publicly speak with me and share their mind, especially when some of what they think, believe, and are willing to share is stuff that might ruffle some feathers. The idea of changing material, our conversation about diluting results by having additional requirements is something that not everyone's willing to chat with me about, but I had a great time talking with Jesse about it. And I think we're on the same page. We're on the same page about a lot of things, especially our dedication to the arts and our love for what it can do for so many people. So thank you, Professor Dwyer. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, have you checked out the show notes yet? The links? Have you checked out the photos that we included? Have you checked all the good stuff out at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com? You should. We got two episodes each week that we bring you, and they're all there. If you want to find episodes on Kempo or Kendpo, you can search for that on that site. There's a reason we tag things and we put the transcripts up. It makes it easy to find stuff that you might be interested. Here we are, 764 episodes in, and every month we see people listening to every episode. Not one person. At least I don't think it's one person. But we do see attention on every episode that we've done in the past because they're all cool. They all have value. 
Speaking of value, if you find value in this show and the other things that we do as a company, please consider supporting us. You got things you can pay for, products, events, but you also have lots of free stuff that take just a little bit of your time. If you've never left us a review, please consider leaving us a review. If you've never shared an episode with someone that might not know about Martial Arts Radio, please consider sharing an episode. We appreciate the support of everyone who has and continues to support all of you Patreon contributors, all of you who post episodes on your social media. Don't worry, I see it. I know you're there. I know you're doing it. It means a great deal to me. You know, I'd love to come to your school and have a seminar. If you are curious about what that might look like, reach out to me. If you have a topic suggestion, if you have a guest suggestion, reach out to me. If you have feedback on what we do as a company, reach out to me. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And Whistlekick social media is, as you might have guessed, at Whistlekick. That takes us to the end. I will see you again soon. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.